Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the next instalment of business support webinars from Westminster Business Council. My name is Sophie Shrubsole. I'm one of the team here at Westminster Business Council. I'm delighted that we're joined today by Prashant and Mark of Wilderco. Wilderco are our go-to accountants, and many of the team there have kindly provided our members at Westminster Business Council with insights and assistance, uh, not only through these last few months, but for, for many years, and we're proud to have them as members. Um, but they are back with us today for the third webinar with us, um, which we're very grateful for. Um, today, um, Mark and Prashant will be talking about keeping your business resilient uh, by looking honestly at your business and making some sensible and bold decisions. And Prashant will also take us through some of the government support measures, including the latest job support scheme. So I can see some of you uh, joining us on the webinar are new to Westminster Business Council. Um, so for those of you that are new, just allow me uh, to take a couple of minutes to tell you a little more about us before we kick off officially. Uh, Westminster Business Council is London's premier business connections network. We help businesses across the capital and now uh, nationally too, given that everyone's gone virtual, um, and we help them by providing business intelligence and connections. Our events programme and introduction service help businesses to develop their client base. And uh, we're also very proud of our work in connecting businesses and the local community. And we've provided hundreds of opportunities for students to access work experience and job opportunities. And we've supported many charities and ensured that people work together for the wider benefit of the city of Westminster. So I'm just going to wait uh, one minute more to allow uh, a few more people to, to log on and hopefully get used to this system. Uh, just a, a few housekeeping rules. Everyone's on mute, uh, so you can sit back and relax and enjoy the presentation today. But um, if you'd like to ask questions of Mark and Prashant, then please do use the Q&A functionality and, and I'll read those questions out for you and, and get those answered for you. Um, so if you, if you have a quick look on your screen, you should be able to find that chat function. Um, and anything that springs to mind that you need help with, please do uh, type those in. That will come straight through to me and I will be able to read out those questions for you and get them answered um, just towards the end of the session. So just a few minutes past three o'clock now and I can see more people are joining us. We've got this session recorded. So um, if the phone rings or the dog comes into the room and you get distracted, don't worry, we've got this recorded and it will be back up on our website for you to go over um, and catch up on. But in the meantime, I think we are ready to start. So, Mark, I am going to hand over to you officially and we look forward to starting off the presentation. Thank you very much, Sophie, and uh, thank you to uh, everyone who has joined us this afternoon. These are indeed turbulent times. I'm sure that many of you um, have had difficulties in your business or your personal finances. And what I'm going to do today is go through some ideas, things that have uh, happened, if you like, uh, in my experience in the last six months dealing with uh, my clients and uh, many friends and uh, refer referrals that have been made to me. And uh, I hope some of it will be interesting. I look forward to seeing what kind of questions you want to ask, but I'm not gonna pull any punches. So, first of all, don't panic. That's got to be the mantra, but be honest. And I'm gonna talk about honesty all the way through. You've got to be honest with yourselves. You've got to assess your current situation, where you stand right now and don't just hope for the best. I think from what we've heard of the second wave that's coming, we're not gonna get back to the best for some time. And those that are bold and take action will survive, and you've got to be honest with yourself. Let's talk about management accounts. Do look at your latest management accounts. Hopefully they were made up to the last month. I'm often quite surprised by the number of businesses I come across who don't have regular sets of accounts prepared. 
It's easy for me to talk. I'm an accountant and I've been used to having monthly management accounts in the management of the business that I'm a partner in for 30 years. But many people do not produce regular accounts. So I will urge you, get your accounting system up to date so that you really know where you are. Be honest about the recoverability of whatever debtors you've got sitting on your sales ledger. If some of them are looking doubtful, you need to take action, but you cannot guarantee that that money is going to come in. And make sure you, make sure you identify all liabilities. Identify everything that's likely to hit you in the next few weeks and anything you put off, get, to get it into your accounts and then assess your current position and revise your budgets and forecasts. And let's talk more about budgets and forecasts. You do have a budget, don't you? I do hope you've got one in your business. I hope you've predicted your sales and your expenses and you've worked out how you, what you need to do every month in order to reach your targets. So compare your current performance, what is shown in the management accounts against your budget. Note how it's changed since the lockdown began and since everyone's business has been affected. See if you can identify the exact factors that have made changes. Then forecast your income expansion for the next 12 months based on what's happening now. And I know we can't really predict when we're going to come out of this and when things are going to get better. But this is something you should constantly be reviewing and updating so that as soon as we see the light at the end of the tunnel, we can begin to plan for a better future. And continue to monitor your performance every month. Get, keep those management accounts up to date. And remember, I said it, I go a lot, over and over this, be honest. Future turnover, how can we look at what the future is going to bring us? So consider your existing sources of income. Have a look back over the last six months and see what has endured and what hasn't. Do not bank on that which is doubtful, only on what you know you can make in the future. Practice the first principles of credit control, and I'll talk about that a bit more on the next slide. And just think about how you might be able to increase sales. Marketing. And it's uh, not a word that everybody loves. And in many businesses, marketing is the first part of, of the costs that tend to be cut. And that can be a mistake. Right now, when people are going out of business, if you're managing to carry on, then if you can market yourself and your products to the customers of those people that have gone out of business, you might actually increase your sales. Can you add new products and services? There have been a lot of very clever people out there who have come across new ideas, new ways of making money, new ways of doing the same things with what you currently do. Look at the clever people in the restaurants and how, what they've done, some of them to survive and others have just shut up shop and given up. So it's the bold that take action and do well. And my friend Tom came up with two new phrases, which I loved during a, a networking discussion a few weeks ago. The first one was future gazing, which, of course, is just at trying to anticipate what's going to happen and try and plan for the future. Try and, try and identify what you think your future of your business should look like. And then you, if you've got an idea of where you've got to get to, then you can work out how to get there. And his second phrase I really love is obstacle flipping. And what that means is that many times when someone's got a, a big problem, a big issue, which is holding them up, they have reasons for why they can't overcome that obstacle. And what you could do is flip that obstacle, find out how to get past it, avoid it, go around it. But if you cheat, treat each obstacle as a challenge to overcome and you concentrate on that, then you can't help but move forward. Consider how many other new ways of doing business you've seen already in the marketplace. So look around and, and just observe what other people have been doing, all the clever new ideas that have come along. And of course, moving online. How many of you have done that? I'm sure many have. My brother-in-law uh, had a, a retail establishment and he had a lot of stock that was uh, not going to be sold if he was shut up his shop for three or four months. He went home, set up an eBay shop, and sold the lot and did very, very well because he took action and he found a different way of doing it. And I, he was quite pleased about the result. So that's something to consider. So I said I'd talk more about credit control. So what you should do 
in these times is obviously check out your potential customers. The issue right now is that if you do manage to get a new sale or a new customer, how do you know they're going to be able to pay you? You can check their credit rating. And obviously that is advisable in all cases of looking at new clients. But right now, will a historic credit rating give you the right answer? You should always have properly drawn up contracts. Whatever you're going to agree with that customer, get it down in writing and make sure they've signed the contract and it's been agreed between you. So there's no misunderstandings in the future. Ask for cash up front. Might not always be easy, but maybe you can get some of the cash up front. Maybe you can have a contract where maybe you charge 40% of the start, 40% uh, on uh, delivery of the first item and the balance when you finish the contract. If you have terms like that, that might protect your cash flow to some extent. Stick to your part of the contract. Make sure you cannot be criticized because often when someone doesn't want to pay you, they come up with some excuse. And it could be that you fail to deliver on time. So make sure you stick to your part of the contract. Invoice promptly. Don't waste any time at all in raising your invoice. Remind the creditor when it's due for payment. So if your payment terms are 30 days, let them know a couple of days in advance, just to remind them. And if it is overdue, chase immediately. Don't wait. Don't think it will come next week. As soon as it's 24 hours, 48 hours overdue, chase that payment. You've got to be diligent about these matters. And if all else fails, use debt collection experts. There are good people out there that can do anything from basic credit control right up to legal enforcement. So you do need to take action quickly, though, because if someone is short of money, this, it's likely that lots of people are awaiting payment from that person. The more you chase, the more you're likely to get your payment, as opposed to those people who haven't bothered to chase, haven't invoiced promptly and haven't reminded that payment is due. Then look at your costs. Do we all know the difference between fixed and variable costs? I think some of these definitions may have blurred a little over the recent months. I mean, I would always have said that rent was a fixed cost, but I can't help thinking that the actual amount the rent that people are paying has varied. And some deals have been done with landlords and doubtless going forward, there are gonna be more deals done with landlords to reduce rents. It'll be interesting to see how many people actually do go back to the office. But understand the difference. A fixed cost is one you usually cannot avoid and your variable costs is where you can take decisions. So what can you just cut? What can you really do without? What can you renegotiate? There are, so there's always something in your accounts where you think maybe you've been paying too much for it. And right now, with a lot of businesses looking for more clients, there are more opportunities to go and get alternative quotes and see if you can get a cheaper price for whatever it is you need. Consider working with a procurement expert. If I told you I know, knew somebody that would look at your costs, like power, telephones, stationery, and various other things, negotiate reductions on those costs for you and not charge you a penny, would you be interested? If so, send me an email and I'll make the introduction. Look at the big costs. I already mentioned rent. Staff, a tricky one, but it's clearly a big cost for many people. And with the end of the full price, if you like, full value furlough scheme, it's going to be a real cost for businesses going forward. The items you need to buy for resale, your materials or your stock, you need to be careful about what you purchase there. Only, be, only purchase what you're confident of selling. Consider things like insurance. Talk to your broker. There are lots of good brokers out there who understand what the current situation is all about. Look at your energy and other contracts similar to that. Anything which is on a fixed price deal is worth looking at again. And anything else, I mean, everyone's business is different. We all have different costs. We all have unusual costs that don't maybe apply to other people. Be meticulous, go through each one and consider 
Can I renegotiate it? Can I cut it? Or can I do with less? Another couple of new expressions. Everyone was mentioning new normal. And my friend Kate said, I don't like new normal. I like fresh start. And the reason she said fresh start was that if you consider that you were restarting your business from scratch right now, so you had a blank sheet of paper, what would it look like? Because for many of us, this is the opportunity we've got. We are now in a situation where many of us are working from home, many of us are unable to work, many of us have had our businesses closed down or curtailed. So when we do start again, if it's the same business or a different one, what would it look like if we started with a brand new fresh start? How can we improve operational efficiency? Do we understand our place in the market? How have our end markets and supply lines changed? And what's different about the marketplace right now? And there are huge differences in some industries because of what's been forced upon us by the lockdown. Become digitally savvy. Another phrase I picked up recently on a networking event. I'm sure many of us have become more aware of the need to use IT carefully and cleverly. We're all, we've all become experts at Zoom or other webinars like this one, which is go-to webinar. All of these techniques to keep in touch with people have been very valuable. I even saw a religious service where as one of the prayers, somebody said, God bless Zoom. So become digitally savvy, be aware. If you weren't already using IT to its best, then learn some new skills. Uh, I've certainly learned many new skills, and uh, there's, it's not true to say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I've learned some very good new ideas during this period. Obviously, we've got to be or remain visible on the web. Increase your web presence. Uh, make sure you're on LinkedIn. Make sure your profile is up to date. You keep in touch with people. Uh, use, uh, Review your website and use social media to the biggest extent you can. Most of you have been invited to this uh, seminar today, this webinar, uh, because of a mailing list you may have been on, but many of you may have seen it on social media as well. And that is the way a lot of people are generating new business. I mean, it's certainly happening in my business, surprisingly. Online collaboration. Now, this is interesting. An awful lot of people have changed the way they do business. And therefore, it is important for you to make sure that you can operate in the way they want you to. So there's a lot of online systems now for um, supplying raw materials, for um, engaging in the contract, for keeping up to date with people. I mean, I'm sure we've all noticed how much better the delivery companies have, have uh, become during this period in letting you know the status of your parcel, where it's got to in the supply chain to reach you from the shop or the business where you, that you ordered it from online. All that kind of thing has become much cleverer, much more closely linked up. So it's important that you understand that you may need to collaborate with people in a new, clever way and be prepared to do that. And if you can use online collaboration tools to make your business more effective, then do so. I mean, electronic signatures is one that's making things a lot easier, for instance, so that documents don't have to be sent around. And giving people the choice, do you really want a hard copy or can I just scan this into you? It's, it's fairly easy, but it makes you much more efficient in the marketplace. And remember, your customers are gonna need convincing before they part with their cash. So if you can convince them that you're running an efficient business and that you're aware of how to deal with them in this new marketplace, you will have an advantage. <laughs> Working from home. I must admit, I've spent a lot of time sitting looking out the same window uh, from my home office, but I do really enjoy getting back into the office, even if we've got a, a small fraction of our normal staff numbers. Um, but working from home is part of the new normal. I don't think it's a fresh start. I don't think it's a positive step, but for many, it may be a permanent situation or a semi-permanent situation. If you are yourself are working from home, then just be aware of uh, looking after yourself properly, taking proper exercise and the other things that you need to do. There's plenty of help out there for you, but also be aware that some of the expenses may be able to be deducted from your tax. 
Um, and also, if you are employing people that are working from home, make sure you have proper practices in place to ensure that you're still looking after their welfare and they're working in a safe environment and that you're also monitoring what they're actually doing to make sure that they're still doing the tasks that they should be doing. It's not an easy thing to manage a team working from home. Most of my team are working from home and it, it is not easy. It takes longer is what I've discovered to keep in touch with everybody. But you've got to cope with it. It's the way the world is right now. My office is in the city of London and believe me, the city is empty. New entrepreneurs. There are lots of people starting new businesses. I've been advising two. Uh, both of them are uh, using social media and uh, the internet to operate their businesses. One uh, is running something that is effectively charitable in its aims, but it, there's a business model in there. And the other is really helping other businesses sell and uh, maximize their impact on the internet. There are lots of these new businesses out there. They're not just, these are not the only two I've uh, come across in the last six months, but there are two I've particularly been helping. And these are potentially uh, new customers for you, or they may be new ideas to you, or you may be one of those new entrepreneurs, in which case, consider how you've set your business up, because for you, it really is a fresh start. And I think you can take advantage of the situation in many ways. Certainly, these people that I'm speaking to aren't taking advantage of the fact that many of us are just sitting at home. And here's a bit of a paraphrase. I think the original um, quote came from uh, The Art of War. But keep your suppliers and customers close and keep your competitors closer still. Keep in touch with your suppliers. Make sure that if there are issues, you can anticipate them. Um, I've, I had a supply issue this morning, something I was trying to do, and uh, I spent a little while trying to see if I can find a way around it, which I haven't managed to do yet, but that's what you need to do. If supplies are going to be a problem, you know what will happen. Your business will slow down. Keep in touch with your customers, especially during these times when we can't meet. Uh, make it a policy of getting in touch with each customer that you can, if, if it's appropriate, at least once a month but keep your competitors closer still. Keep an eye on what the competition is doing. If they've got some clever ideas, steal them. Why not? There's nothing new under the sun, but if someone comes up with a new angle in these difficult times, exploit it if you come across it. So I'll now hand over to my colleague and Prashant will go through some of the details of the government schemes that are now available. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm a tax specialist here at Waldeco, and I help our clients navigate the complex world of tax. This afternoon, I will provide you with an overview of where we are with the COVID-19 government schemes and some thoughts on additional help available for businesses. However, before I go on to that, I would like to touch on some points regarding tax and the next budget. Pre-budget planning. So we all know that the, the November budget has been canceled and we are now likely to have a spring budget in 2021. Our economy has suffered significant costs due to the pandemic, and this is almost certain that it will, it will bring about changes to our tax rates and rules. As the, budget, as the budget has been delayed, there is now some time to plan on transactions in order to take advantage of current rates and reliefs. Business owners who are looking to sell their business, for example, or maybe pass it down to the next generation, may wish to take steps before the next budget. For instance, before there is, there is, an, there is an increase in the capital gains tax rate, uh, they may want to uh, put 
put, put through their transactions. Um, other examples are to do with inheritance tax, where reliefs like potentially exempt transfers and business property relief could be significantly reduced or abolished. Um, potentially exempt transfers are when assets can be gifted and there is no inheritance tax due if the donor survives for seven years from the date of the gift. Transfers of wealth to the next generation prior to the budget should be considered. Corporation tax. Rates may increase, so planning might be helpful in instances, for example, where a business makes capital expenditure, which immediately qualifies as an expense, thereby reducing the business's taxable profits. Therefore, if commercially possible, such expenditure could be delayed to be incurred after the budget, i.e. after rates have gone up so that the tax saving can be greater for that business. Um, stamp duty land tax. Uh, we, we, we currently have a more generous residential stamp duty land tax rate where where individuals would not pay any stamp duty land tax of up to a value of half a million, or, or if they are not first time buyers, they, they would only pay a 3% uh, additional charge. Um, now, now that rate is obviously going to be reset to what was the old rate after March, 2021. So, so that is one aspect to consider. Let us now have a brief overview of existing COVID-19 schemes that the government introduced in response to the pandemic. The Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme. This is the all famous furlough scheme. The government paid 80% of furloughed employees' wages for most of the scheme's duration. It is coming to an end uh, at the end of this month and claims need to be made by the end of November 2020. We also have the job retention bonus, which was introduced to incentivize employers to keep furloughed staff in employment. The government will, will be giving a grant of £1,000 per employee for any furloughed staff who have been retained as at March, as at, sorry, 31st January 2021. A claim for the job retention bonus can be made between 15th of February 2021 and 31st March 2021. The Self-Employment Income Support Scheme. This is a grant scheme for self-employed uh, persons and it is based on their historical self-employed earnings. It, so, Sorry, it, it, it comprised of two, two, two grants. Uh, the first grant uh, closed on 13th of July, 2020, and applications for the second grant need to be made by 19th of October, so within a few days. The government also had various local authority grants and these were made available for businesses occupying commercial premises, especially in the retail, hospitality and leisure sectors. These schemes are now closed as of 30th September 2020. So in response to the second wave of the pandemic, the Chancellor announced approximately two and a half weeks ago a new winter economic plan. The Winter Economy Plan contains measures to provide financial assistance for businesses, albeit at a much lower level than in the past. The Job Support Scheme. This is part of the Winter Economy Plan. So the government introduced this scheme, which is, which is a new wage subsidy scheme and open to all employers. It replaces the coronavirus job retention scheme 
but it is not linked to the job retention scheme. It will be operational from 1st of November 2020 right up to 30th of April 2021. So it will cover six months. So to be eligible for the scheme, employees are required to work at least 33% of their usual hours, so one third of their working time. For these worked hours, the employer will give the employees their full pay. For non-worked hours, the employer is expected to fund one third of usual pay and the government will fund one third of usual pay, but subject to a monthly cap of 697 pounds. The grant will not cover employers national insurance or pension contributions. So this will have to be borne by the employer. Employers are to be reimbursed by HMRC after the salary has been reported through the digital payroll system. And HMRC will be informing employees directly about claims made by their employer. On Friday last week, the Chancellor announced an expansion to this job support scheme. This will be for businesses which may be asked to close their premises due to coronavirus restrictions. The government will support eligible businesses by paying 67% of each employee's salary up to a maximum of £2,100 per month per employee. The self-employed income support scheme has also been extended uh, as part of the winter economy plan and it, it has been extended to April 2021 as well. So there are two further grants as part of the, the new self-employed income support scheme. The first grant will cover three months from November 2020 to January 21. And under this grant, 20% of average monthly trading profits will be covered by the grant. The grant will be paid out in one single installment and it will be capped at £1,875 in total, so much lower than the previous grants. The second grant will, will cover a further three months from February to April 2021. And details of this second new second grant will, will, will be published uh, by the government once they have reviewed it in due course. But these are significantly smaller grants, uh, as I said, than those previously given when the, when the scheme was first introduced. The winter economy plan also has some extensions and deferrals. So VAT, uh, a 5% VAT rate for hospitality and tourism was introduced in July 2020, and it was originally expected to be in place until January 2021, until the 12th of January 2021. So the, the winter economy plan extends the application of this rate to 31st March, 2021. This 5% rate applies to the supply of food, non-alcoholic drinks, the supply of accommodation and tickets for attractions. So it's, it's, it's there to boost the hospitality and tourism industry. Businesses may have deferred VAT liabilities that arose between 20th of March 2020 and June 2020. So the winter economy plan has now brought in a new payment scheme which enables the deferral of, of these liabilities to be extended further. It was originally due to be paid by the 31st March 2021 in total, but the new payment scheme now allows businesses to spread this payment over a further 11 installments right up to 31st of March 2022. So it gives businesses some more cash flow benefit. 
Similarly, the second payment on account for income tax, now this will affect all taxpayers, um, not only businesses, um, the, the second payment on account was deferred uh, and, and instead of the normal due date of 31st July 2020, the deferral was that it could be paid by 31st January 2021. So as part of the winter economy plan, uh, a new time to pay facility has been introduced, which will allow uh, taxpayers to spread their second payment on account over 12 monthly installments, taking them up to 31st January 2022, when they would finally settle that liability. Um, it will be taxpayers who have up to 30,000 pounds of deferred tax liabilities. The government also provided a variety of government-backed loans and finance schemes when our economy went into lockdown in March. Applications, application deadlines for these loans and finance schemes have now been extended to 30th November 2020, giving businesses a chance to raise additional finance. The BBLS, which is the Bounce Back Loan Scheme, provides loans of up to 50,000 pounds, which are 100% government backed. The CBILS, which is a coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, provides loans of up to 5 million pounds to SMEs, and these loans are 80% government backed. Uh, the similar CL bills scheme, which is the coronavirus large business interruption loan scheme, provides loans of up to 200 million pounds for large businesses, which are also government backed. The future fund is for innovative companies where the government provides convertible loans of up to five million pounds on a matching basis with private investors. So there are some thoughts on the winter economy plan and just generally. Let us look at the new job support scheme. Is it expensive? Many, many employers may think so as they will be paying employees for non-working hours. In addition, employers will incur an, a national insurance liability charge as well as pension contribution charges for those non-working hours covered by the government grant. Therefore, it will be important for an employer to plan in advance to understand whether the job support scheme is appropriate for them. They would need to consider whether there will be enough cash flow in the business to support employees on the job support scheme. Employers should bear in mind that the job retention bonus for employees who are previously furloughed could provide some cash flow to the benefits, which could go towards supporting employees on the job support scheme. At, at a time when businesses are faced with significant challenges, threatening their very survival, employers should also be assessing whether part-time working arrangements will be productive. The job support scheme requires part-time working arrangements. So is this going to be productive for your business? Employers will also need to assess whether there is enough work to cover one third of employees' usual hours in order to use the scheme. So is there any additional help? You would need to look around, obviously, um, uh, for any additional help. Um, one thought is uh, that help could be sought from unaffected employees. Redundancies are normally seen as a last resort and employers could seek help from such unaffected employees. For example, by requesting a temporary reduction in working hours, thereby freeing up some cash flow to support those employees who are at risk of redundancy 
and may need to be put on to the job support scheme. In addition, there, there are 38 local enterprise partnership growth hubs covering England. These are business-led partnerships between local authorities and local businesses, and their objective is to drive economic growth in their area. So since we're based in London, I will look at the London Business Hub, which is the de designated growth hub for the London area. With the London Business Hub, SMEs can access government grants between £1,000 to £5,000. And the purpose of this funding is to help businesses access professional, legal, financial, or other advice. These grant monies may also be used on new technology and other minor equipment to address the business's immediate needs in response to the impact of COVID-19. Applications for this grant can be made from the 16th of October, which is this Friday, and, and you can find more information about it in the London Business Hub website. The, the London Business Hub is also offering a free platform called Pay It Forward. This is where businesses can pre-sell their services to raise cash flow. The, the way this would work is a business would pre-sell the services it offers for delivery at a future date, but the business would get the cash in in the present. And this, this will pr provide the business with additional cash flow. And the mayor of London will also match fund this by up to 5,000 pounds on this paid forward platform. So growth hubs for each area will have their own variety of incentives and free help for local businesses. Finally, there is the kickstart scheme, which may be useful for businesses which are experiencing an increase in demand and need more staff, but cannot afford to pay full wages immediately. The kickstart scheme will fund employers to enable them to create job placements for young people aged 16 to 24 and, and those who are receiving universal credit. And the funding for each person employed under the scheme will cover the full wage for that person for 25 hours a week based on the national minimum wage. Employers national insurance contributions, employers pension contributions, and an additional £1,500 to be used by the employer to support and train the young employee with the aim to increase the skill set and employability on completion of the Kickstart job placement. So I hope this has been helpful to you and I will now hand over to Mark again. Thank you very much. Sorry about this, everyone. I didn't move my screen forward. I was so busy listening to whatever Prashant had to say. And I'd like to thank him for keeping across all of these complex issues, which he's done within our practice for the last six months and keeping all of the uh, members of our team uh, fully informed of what's available. We do have a coronavirus hub on our website with more information, but uh, hopefully that's given you all a few ideas of some of the things that are worth looking into. And whereas there are a, quite a few new um, government support ideas, I do get the impression that it's not as good as it was before, that the government can't afford to do much more. And I think we've got to dig ourselves out of this using our own intuition and our own skills. So whatever you decide, check it out. Do your research. Have a good look around, talk to people. Accountants can be helpful.
I hope your accountant can be helpful. If not, come and talk to us. Share with your trusted business friends. I hope all of you are in networks where you meet and chat and you're able to uh, have ideas and discuss with people. I'm fortunate enough to be in quite a few good ones. Prashant and I attend uh, networking events, talk to Westminster Business Council because they have a massive membership uh, of all kinds of businesses. There may be someone that can help you. There is a mentor scheme within Westminster Business Council, which I hope Sophie is still running. Uh, you can tell me about that later, but that might uh, assist you. Um, so do talk with your business friends. Help is everywhere. It's on the web, your friends and your family and the networks that you're part of. Grab that help, chat things through. But overall, be aware, because if all else does fail, take professional advice quickly. Don't risk too much, protect your home and your family, and please don't risk things you cannot live without. I've spoken to many, many people who are just hoping and waiting, and, uh, and sadly, the help may not come. Finally, take action. Whatever you've picked up from today's webinar, whatever thoughts you've already had, whatever you've been contemplating, take action. If you want to talk it through with someone, do that. Talk it through with me. I'm happy to chat with any of you, but do take action. And remember, some of what you need to do will not be nice. If you've got to let people go, make people redundant, it's an awful thing to have to do. Some may be absolutely scary. You might be shutting down parts of your business. You might be giving up on things that you hoped would be very successful, but concentrate on what is gonna keep you in business. Taking action will make you feel better. Doing something, moving forward is certainly a positive step. I know in our business, we've been determined, we've been faithful to what we decided at the very beginning, and we're all working hard as a team to carry our business through this. And thankfully, our clients have been supporting us. We've been very lucky. Remember that you're doing it to protect your business, for your remaining staff, the people that I hope you'll be able to keep on, and for your family and for yourself. Don't forget, help is available. Use your networks and advisors. If you're looking for guidance, we'd be happy to assist you. And we don't charge anything for a chat. So. I'd like to finally thank you all for attending. I'd like to thank Sophie and Westminster Business Council for hosting this and for all the things they do and the other webinars, some of which I've attended, which have been very good. And if you have any questions, Sophie will now uh, hopefully be able to ask us and we'll give uh, her best answers. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Prashant. That was fantastic. Thank you for taking us through that. Um, lots of food for thought, um, but ending on a really positive note mark about the networks that are out there and the support that's out there and the importance of asking for help and realizing that you're not alone there are lots of people out there that, that want to help you so if through that presentation any questions have come to mind do just pop them into the uh, the q a box and i will read them out for you we've had uh, a few come in already so um i'm going to throw them at you mark Shant. so first one that came in um is there any financial help out there for startup businesses where should someone start looking for financial help for new businesses <laughs> uh Prashan, i don't think there's anything particularly in the covid re uh, related uh, grants are there no there basically there's nothing covid related uh, for startup businesses uh, but uh, startup businesses obviously uh, can uh, the way the way startup businesses normally work is is they if they have an idea they would they would look for funding from investors etc. So so there is help out there in terms of how to how to go about with fundraising getting equity investors on board. Um, uh, there are incentive schemes like the EIS or SEIS schemes where an investor investing into your business would be able to get tax relief uh, on, on, on their own taxes. Uh, so so there, is, there are ways to, to, to get funding, um, but there's no, no government scheme for any startup businesses as such to, 
in, in forms of grants or anything uh, anything like that. It's certainly, if, if, if a startup business has been going on for 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 some time and has has uh, some level of turnover, etc., then the then the bounce back loan scheme is available, uh, where the business can get up to fifty thousand pounds of loans, which which is a very cheap loan um, and which is hundred percent backed by the government. Uh, so that is one thing to consider for an existing business, which is a recent startup. And would they qualify for the kickstart scheme? The kickstart scheme is 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 mainly to do with um, bringing in youngsters into employment, youngsters who are who are on who are claiming universal credits and creating jobs for them. So so certainly if if a start if a startup business is looking to employ uh, any any anybody, uh, then they might want to look at the kickstart scheme to to be able to get six months worth of worth of staff without having to pay for it or pay very little for it. So so it is some some way of indirect funding uh, where you can get personnel onto your team uh, without without having to pay for it uh, because the government is backing that. Thanks, Prashant. Yeah. With a quick question on the back of that is what's the catch? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I, I, in terms of the kickstart scheme, I, I don't think there's a catch, but it's obviously the government funding this to 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 give an opportunity to for those youngsters who are who are out of employment and claiming universal credits at the moment. So so it's a benefit, obviously. Um, but what a business might find is that the 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 personnel that they get will not be experienced. They will have to train them. So so it is a bit of a give and take. Yeah, so it, it's the same sort of considerations about bringing anyone into the business, um, I guess, is is the, is, uh, the answer there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, another question. Um, can you give some examples of tax deductible expenses, please? <laughs> well, you mean when you're working at home? <laughs> OK, it's yes. not as great yes, as it sounds, but uh, Prashan, again, do you want to take this one? See, you're the expert here, mate. <laughs> I can't, well, um, sure, sure. If so, an employee ha didn't have broadband and they had to install broadband to be able to work from home, they can claim that. Um, an employer can always um, provide uh, an employee with a mobile phone and uh, that mobile phone would not be a taxable benefit for that, for that employee. Um, uh, there is, there is uh, there's a standard rate uh, of uh, six pounds per week, uh, which covers uh, any expenses up to that amount uh, for an employee working from home. Uh, so yeah, these are these are some of the expenses which which an employee could claim working from home. It's not as generous as it might seem, um, but if if you do have uh, costs relating to working at home then you can look at them in two ways first of all you can look at the square footage of your house that you're using and then look at the hours that you use it for just for business and it must be just for business you've got to be honest and then look at the overhead costs of running your house which will include your council tax it'll include your gas and electricity um, and you can allocate a portion of those costs but sadly when you actually do the calculation properly uh, for most people, it won't be a huge amount of money, but it's something. Yeah. Um, Correct. You, and you have to be quite careful and realistic about it. You can't uh, you can't overclaim these things. Doubtless, as you've probably seen, as many of you have seen, there have already been instances of people that have been uh, caught out uh, trying to fraudulently claim under some of these schemes. And uh, the, I mean, the revenue uh, are not silly, and they will be looking quite carefully to see if anyone is uh, stretching the point somewhat. You need to be careful, but take advice from your accountant. Um, there might be other things you can do as well, but uh, there are some costs you can claim. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Um, going back to the new uh, job support scheme, what are the normal wages, especially for people who are not on a fixed salary? So say for, for an employee who has not previously claimed uh, the JRS help 
previously. Is, is there anything you can comment on that, please? Uh, yes, um, details are, have not yet been published uh, in terms of all the intricacies of, uh, of when an individual's salary would be referred to. But, but if we take the job retention scheme as an example, uh, an, employee, an employee's salary as at, as at the end of February or the middle of March 2020 is used as the base salary or on which they would be paid uh, whilst they were on furlough. So, so a similar, similar, similar salary reference date will will be will be in point, and it is it it will be the twenty it will be on or before the twenty fourth of September when the job support scheme was announced. So, so, so if an employee has not been on the job retention scheme and and on furlough. And their their salary at that point uh, in September 2020 will be used to be based uh, to to be based on for the job support scheme. Okay, thank you. And and just to, to um, make note for our listeners um, again, if there's anything that you want clarified for your business, uh, Mark and Prashant have kindly said that they'd be happy to speak with you um, on a one-to-one -one basis and we'll share um, you can see Mark and Prashant's details on the screen but we'll um, send them to you directly so there's if there's anything you want to discuss further then please do so um, for clarification and we've got a, a couple more questions here um, where can you find information on uh, the implications of working from home when it comes to GDPR Mm. Well, again, um, GDPR is something I know quite a bit about. Um, I don't think when they drafted GDPR, they really anticipated um, so many people that would ordinarily work in a workplace, an office or a factory or something or a shop um, working from home. Um, but it does cover any business activity. So any personal data that you may be dealing with in any way is still covered by the GDPR rules. So every organization should have a set of rules and guidelines as to um, how they should protect personal data, um, that they should only collect personal data for genuine business reasons, and they should only use it uh, for those business reasons and, and not breach the rules of the, of the act. And equally, if anyone um, asks them to provide them with copies of anything. Uh, uh, I forget the exact phrase, but personal information that's being held, you can you can make a, a claim to see anything, then you've got to comply with that. And the right to see that data will include data that's held for the business, perhaps on a personal computer at home. I mean, in my business, we, we don't allow people to carry out a work on, on their home computers. Everyone has got a business laptop, and therefore uh, any data will be kept on a business machine. But I'm sure during these times, many people have used their own computers. And there is a danger that uh, business, uh, the personal data collected for very um, proper um, business reasons does end up on a personal computer. And I think uh, it was important for the individuals and for the businesses concerned to uh, be aware that uh, their employees need to understand that that data must be used in the same careful way and protected in the same careful way. Uh, and when this is all over, it should be removed from personal computers. But I, again, the legislation itself, I don't think anticipated this, and I don't think there'll be much guidance out there. You could Google it and see what you come up with. And I'm sure there's many um, professionals out there who'll be pleased to give you lots of detailed advice. But uh, at the end of the day, I don't think anything's been published on that matter. Thank you, Mark. We will keep an eye out uh, for, for any updates. But as you say, yeah. um, <laughs> no one was anticipating the world to look like yeah. this and uh, the need for GDPR to reflect that. But um, you've made a very good point. Um, OK, just a couple more questions as we, we draw towards four o'clock. Um, are there any issues with... IR35 for staff that have been furloughed and taken on consultancy work to try and top up their finances. 
I love your chuckle, Mark. Your, <laughs> your that's a very good question. It's an excellent question, yeah. Yeah, uh, but the IR35, um, obviously, any 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 contract work is looked at on its own merits. So, so if 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 they have taken on a separate contract with with a different company independent from their employer, they, they that contract work will be looked at on its own merits. And if it is very much like an employment relationship, then then I'm afraid that it would be caught within the IR35 rules. Um, uh, uh, in terms of practicality, maybe maybe because of the very temporary nature of of, of the contract, and uh, and uh, it may be that uh, that the contractor was does not does not have as many facilities which an employee would have. It it could be that that it it it, it is not caught within the IR thirty five, but there's no definite there's no definite answer to say that if because of them being on furlough they've taken a separate contract that they would not fall outside of the IR35. Yeah I'd, I'd agree with everything Prasha has said then uh, but the reason I chuckled is that uh, uh, you have a lot of arguments with the revenue about IR35 or potentially you can and obviously uh, it's, it's, if someone wants to avoid being caught by IR35 they can take various steps to minimize the risk. I know some of the steps you could take is to uh, don't work at uh, anyone's office, work in your your own office or at home. Um, don't work the hours that are stated by your potential employer. You know, work your own hours, um, use your own equipment. And that's what everyone is doing at home right now. They're not working in their employer's office. They're using their own computers and their own desk. And they're, you know, they're probably working from seven in the morning and either finishing early or maybe they get up late and work late. So they're not working the same hours. Um, and if you're not getting things like holiday pay paid for or sick pay, then I think if you add all that together, I'd, uh, I'd happily argue that you're outside IR35. But um, as Prashant said, and he's the guy that reads the legislation, there's no clear, clear guidance on this. So you're taking a bit of a risk, but I'm sure there are ways you can minimize that risk to show that you are on a genuine arm's length contract and not an employee. Brilliant, thank you, Mark. And Prashant reads the legislation so we don't have to, which is really helpful. No, 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 no. But that, that, that's his particular skill. He's, he, he's very good at analyzing what the rules say. So even in our office, when I've got an issue, I go to him to check it out. <laughs> he's thank you, Mark. <laughs> So we're just drawing past uh, past four o'clock now. Um, so I, I'm going to bring us to a to a close. So that really just leaves me to thank Mark and Prashant for sharing their time and expertise today. Uh, if you want to listen to this recording again, it will be up on our website shortly. Um, and if you want to carry on the conversation with Mark and Prashant, we'll be um, in touch soon with their um, contact details so that you can get in touch. Um, so to our members and to guests, um, thank you so much for tuning in today. Please keep in touch with Westminster Business Council and let us know if there's anything we can do to support you or your business. I do keep an eye out for our newsletters and invitations to future events. And thank you all again for joining. Uh, keep safe and we'll see you again soon. Thanks all. Thank you, Sophie. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.